Freeman is uh, positively a good read still. Oh, and um, even though maybe we have switched or some have mm -hmm. switched on their ideation of Lee as an example, maybe Washington not as much, although he's now been humanized as well in Chernell's book. Um, but uh, I know he's still read and still desirable. Lee's Lieutenants is a spe spectacular book. I think this is his best of, of the lot. Um, Keith, give us an idea of what you're talking about, about when you talk about Southern identity and the problem with identity as a concept today. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened uh, to change that and what was it in the first place? Well, let me make a point about, about Freeman. I, I, anyone who uh, attempts to, to look at Dr. Freeman uh, is immediately shamed as a historian. No one ever has had or ever will, I doubt, will have the energy and dedication that, that, that Freeman did in, in, in the work that he put forth to reveal as clearly and as realistically as possible the, uh, the reality that existed uh, from the historical record. And it's not only a work of, of uh, meticulous research, you know, the, the craft of the historian, but it's also art, I think, because of the way he, his phraseology and his, his ability to create images from the, the, the facts. Uh, and uh, I think both, both Ari Lee and certainly Lee's lieutenants creates that, that uh, recreation of life as it must really have been. Did pragmatism and rationality drive him? I think what drove him was the desire to make history live. Mm -hmm. All of us do, mm -hmm. but but I think Freeman had a had particular drive that he believed that without the kind of effort he had to put forth, that, that the story of the war would be lost, that, that the, the real understanding of what went on would be lost. And so it was his mission it was, uh, that he dedicated himself to uh, to create this, well, re recreate the, the, uh, the images and the sounds and the sights and the emotions of, of the war. The thoroughness with which he worked, you cannot ignore. Uh, for example, I spent eight years producing a 957-page biography of Jackson. Freeman spent 25 years, 25 years, a quarter century, putting together his lead. You simply cannot ignore it. Now, while he's, he's coming under criticism today mainly for two reasons. Uh, one, as a uh, professor at LSU once said, Dr. Freeman never got off his knees long enough to write <laughs> a decent biography of Lee, which is a gross overstatement. But nonetheless, he is very, very sympathetic to Lee. But also, one must remember that it's been uh, cl close to 80 years since R.E. Lee first came out, and an enormous amount of new manuscript printed material has come forth at that time. And that is the basis really for modern day scholarship on Freeman. Either you're damning him uh, for his, uh, his, his, his pure southernism, uh, which Keith so masterfully has, has captured, or else uh, he's just dated. But nonetheless, if you're going to do any work on Lee or the Army of Northern Virginia, you have to start with Dr. Freeman yeah. because of these great works. A lot of that came from his father and the memories that he had and mm -hmm. brought to his son, Douglas Southall, and uh, in a way gave him the route, the road to go to, and he stayed within that road uh, most of his life uh, on the Southern cause. And I, I know sometimes he's damned a bit because he uh, perhaps already came up with a conclusion uh, as to what he wanted to go to, and he, not that he had to fit much into that because the, the facts are there too, but uh, he had maybe a, a conclusion that he wanted to get to and he did it, and did that hurt his objectivity? No, I don't think so. There's a, in, I make up a, a uh, point in the book where Freeman was uh, talking with a, a group of, of young men in Richmond, it was called the Current Events Class, where they would meet once a week to talk about all kinds of things, current events, uh, and Freeman led that discussion. And the question was raised once, the, the dreaded question about, well, is, you know, was when Lee made his, his choice, was he swayed in some way, uh, his choice to, to, to resign from the, the United States Army, uh, you know, was that choice swayed by certain personal uh, interests or, or ambition or anything like that? And Lee, uh, uh, and, and the question was whether Lee was, 
was uh, not uh, the, the looking at it from a, a, an unselfish way. And Freeman said, it, it's a choice that, that any Southerner would have made. It's just a natural choice. There was no question as to why this would happen. And it's very revealing of both Freeman as a Southerner and also his approach to Lee is that, is that uh, this idea of, of why even be confused about or, or be concerned about whether it was a, a, was a, a choice, an agonizing choice. Uh, it really wasn't. It was a natural choice. It was what a man uh, from this time in this circumstance as a Virginian, as a Southerner, would do. And, and Freeman had no qualms about stating that as an absolute. And it reveals, I think, going back to the original question about identity, it goes back to this revelation of, of to make those kinds of, of assumptions about someone as a historian and, and sifting the evidence so carefully. Part of that is influenced by this, this explication of identity, that it is clear, it's understood, there's no question, it's natural. And that is, revela is revelatory of, of identity, mm -hmm. that, that you accept it without question. And, of course, those who stand outside say, well, maybe it's not so simple. But from Freeman's perspective and Southern perspective, there is no question. I should add from my perspective, uh, I don't think the decision was difficult at all for Lee. I think it's been grossly exaggerated, and we can use arithmetic to show why. Uh, when the United States was created in 1787, Virginia was 180 years old when they accepted this experiment in the new government. Put another way, in 1860, when the war began, the Lee family had lived in Virginia for 225 years. And thirdly, uh, we must never look at the past through the lenses of the present. Today, the federal government dominates our lives. But as I told the round table last night, uh, if you had lived in 1860, the federal government touched your life one way. It delivered your mail. That's the only contact you had with Washington. Uh, nine out of ten Americans had no idea what our flag looked like. We had no national anthem. We have to remember that the young nation of 70 years was still in great part shaped and determined uh, by this state right issue. Uh, slavery is the overwhelming cause of the war. I'm not inserting state rights as a substitute for slavery. Slavery starts the war. But state rights was there, and it was very, very strong. And uh, that's part of identity. Identity, and Absolutely. yes, and so when Lee made his decision, he announced, I cannot lift my sword against my country, my children, my birthright. He is a Virginian. He's a member of the mother state. And so I disagree with, with many, including a couple of artist friends who are very dear to me, and I disagree that, Link, that Lee agonized over this. His wife said he claimed he did. But I agree with Keith. I think uh, his decision was pretty well natural. Yeah, there's nowhere else for him to go. Yes, you know. As far as his own identity. Indeed, there are historians but. today who say George H. Thomas staying with the Union was was a very unnatural thing uh, to happen in the Civil War. And he, his, his family turned his portrait to the yes, wall and yeah. never spoke of him. Never do today. And Southampton County does not even acknowledge That's his true. existence. A lot of others like that, too. Yeah. Holtz is a good example, example. Uh, exactly. who we had uh, a book on him recently, uh, General Holt. And here he, uh, he was a slaveholder yeah. himself and turned his back on all of that. And uh, a lot of his family uh, didn't forgive him for mm -hmm. that. So that's not an uncommon story, I'd bet. No. throughout the war. And it goes back to those emotions. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is a, it's a terrifying choice. It really is. Uh, that very few Americans have ever had to face. Uh, and no, here, it, was a, it was a general, it was a soldier's dream to say that he's off with yeah. supreme command. Yeah. And every soldier dreams of that. And Lee, I've been in that room at Blair House. I've been in that room. Right. And uh, you can just see how the feelings had to have been right at that moment. Yeah, it was uh, a terrible choice, but yeah. I think Lee, the Virginian and Lee, was so yeah. so deeply planted. Well, it's hard to go from all this loftiness that we're doing here <laughs> to shoes, but that's what we're doing. And uh, I just want to show some of the artifacts. When I came to this page, just boom, right in my face, and I could feel my feet and how they must have been in that slogging along for miles and miles and miles and miles on each side. And that's what I like about this book also, is that it, it is a potpourri of stuff. It is. It's a, a, 
and I think it's also dessert as well as appetizers. And you're going to see uh, a page, sometimes four, of one side of the content. And your content is wonderful because you do make people feel about what's happening there and tell asides that most of us have not seen before or heard. And then next to it, we have artifacts that make all of this come alive as well uh, in a very real sense. And something that buffs can themselves obtain and have in their home. That's how I think one relates to, to the past is through an artifact. And also that's how you teach younger people who you know, go to a museum and they've never seen some of these things before except through glass and at a distance. All of a sudden they can touch something gently, but they can touch something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very important in the world of artifacts as well. Uh, so shoes is one of them. There's so many different things in here. One of the things that I kind of liked was, um, well, many of them. You can go almost anywhere in there. You don't have to read from A to Z. You can just pop in there. Um, but, uh, oh, for instance, mascots and pets. And that I learned that ca a camel was a pet. Yes, the Mississippi Regiment right. had a camel for several <laughs> weeks. Jeff, Jeff they realized the that the down. camel That's was probably right. a greater enemy than the Union Army. So <laughs> yeah. They got rid of the camel. But uh, you know, in in the book, I tell the story. For example, the most famous mascot of all the uh, young eaglet, which was given to the Eighth Wisconsin, and he became old Abe. He's well remembered. He was an inspiration to the troops after the war. He was a star at veterans reunions and he became truly the symbol of the bald eagle that is a national eagle and uh, uh, in 1881 he died in the arms of his keeper and, but he lives on and if you go to Vicksburg today uh, you'll see the, the, the largest monument on the battlefield is the Wisconsin monument it's uh, 57 and a half feet tall and on the top there's a bronze statue of, a six feet statue of old Abe but in one other way he lives in World War II uh, he was resurrected, so to speak, and today uh, you can see a soldier in the army, and many of them will be wearing a patch with an eagle's head, and they, uh, it's one of the most revered patches in our service. It's the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, they call themselves the Screaming Eagles, and uh, I think old Dave would be proud of that. Well, another one that you uh, have in here, I don't know if I'm going to be able to open it up to it, uh, is... Uh, illustrations that occurred during the war. You know, photography was new, and you could not put a, um, uh, a photograph directly onto a newspaper like Leslie's or Harper's, but uh, so you have to have the woodcutter in between. But you have a wonderful little uh, story here on Thomas Nast. And uh, I had forgotten that, here we are in the Christmas uh, time, that he really is the one who popularized Santa Claus as we know today. Indeed, he created Santa Claus. Yeah, well, he, he created the idea for America and maybe then the world. And the image Santa that Claus, everyone And the image still used. And uh, he also created the Democratic donkey, the Republican elephant, Uncle Sam, John and Rose. was a cartoonist uh, with a social conscience as well. Yes. So he really took an editorial view in Harper's. He was the father of editorial page cartoons, and he was so vicious with a pen that the legend is popular that the, the adjective nasty. Mm -hmm. came from Thomas Nast. I'm not sure of this, but he was just vicious with a pen. And all, despite all of these cartoons, political cartoons, he drew over 20 plus years, he is still most remembered as the man who created Santa 